I want to welcome you all back for another SLAM seminar. Um, we're happy today to have as our guest David Niemi from Kaplan Inc. He is, I won't get your title exactly correct, so I'll leave it for you to put it sure. up. Sure. He's leading up efforts around analytics and in investigations of that for Kaplan. This is particularly interesting because they live in a different environment from us. <clears throat> you know, we can't tell anybody what to do or anything like that. And so when we go to try to collect data, it's very inhomogeneous and changeable. Um, they have the good fortune of being in an environment where there are many classes being taught on the same subject by a lot of different people, and you might actually be able to tell them what to do so that you can do experiments. Or maybe I'm wrong about that. You'll tell us about how well you can do it. We can tell them. That doesn't mean they're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we can't even tell them. Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, I have talked with Roar Saxberg, who also works with David about this topic. I, I saw him give a talk about it. Very interesting. So we're looking forward to hearing what David has to say. And I am too, thank you. Well, it was a long trip to get here, but it's already been worth it for me. We had some great, a great discussion at breakfast this morning, and it was nice to sit in with one of the little fellows meetings and see what you all are up to. So uh, I've been getting a lot out of this, and I hope you'll find this presentation worthwhile for you too. Um, I think this is an area, learning analytics, where uh, a lot of people are kind of excited about it, but nobody has really figured out exactly what we're doing in this area. So the more we can share ideas and resources, I think the better off we'll all be and the more we can speed along progress in the whole field. And of course, I'm honored to be part of this series, and I, I say I'm honored because I actually had a chance to look at some of the previous SLAM discussions and was really impressed by how well people have laid out what previous presenters have laid out, what some of the key issues are and some of the paths people are taking to address those issues. In fact, uh, as I was looking at them, I started to think about, now what am I going to talk about that's actually any different from what folks have already discussed with you? And I've decided that one thing I can talk about, which they probably didn't know much about, is how Kaplan is really thinking about learning analytics and what we are doing currently. And I'll tell you a little bit about Kaplan, too, that might help you understand why we're doing all the different kinds of things that we're, we're doing. And I particularly decided to focus on examples of work that are different from what you've seen. So we, for example, are developing faculty dashboards and learning dashboards and so on, but you had a very nice presentation on that before, so I'm not going to focus on that, um, or course recommenders or career recommenders and some of the other things. I've tried to pick areas where um, we're doing things that haven't been already discussed. Now, you probably are working on some of those areas yourself, so that, that might be an interesting interaction we can get into in the discussion that will follow, how you might be doing similar things or um, even in some cases, we may want to collaborate on some of the work, which I think would be a, a very excellent outcome for this whole trip. So just a word about Kaplan. Um, for those of you who have never heard of us, um, or if you have heard of us, it may have been in connection with our test preparation unit. That's how Kaplan started as a test preparation group, really preparing students for college entrance tests. And it's now expanded, so we have, as part of our test preparation unit, you know, GRE and LSAT and MCAT and bar review courses, really, to help students get ready for those tests. And it's kind of an interesting feature. We wouldn't really have a business if the tests were better aligned with what's actually being taught in courses and what, what people are actually supposed to be doing in their programs later on. But the fact is, you know, if you're a law student, when you go through a typical law program, you're not prepared at all to take the bar exam, so you have to go take special courses, and that's sort of the niche that Kaplan originally filled. But we now have expanded within the last 10 years, so it's a, kind of a huge entity that encompasses a lot of different units, academic units around the world, including language schools, in um, primarily in Asia, Asia Pacific, um, in the United States, and the UK, where students are coming to learn English primarily, and many of them with the idea of um, increasing their chances of succeeding in universities either in the United States uh, or in the UK. So that's a pretty big operation. But our biggest unit overall is really our online university, Captain University, which has I think now about 60,000 students or, or so, who are studying online but with <clears throat> help virtually from, from teachers. So faculties actually work with sections of courses uh, and do synchronous sessions where they lecture, do presentations, and provide other materials to students that they think will, will help them understand the course. But the, the essential course content 
is actually developed by central faculty teams, course development teams working with instructional designers, and then that content is kind of available to everybody. So we, you know, unlike here where faculty could choose their own texts, and as I did when I was at the uh, University of Missouri at Columbia, I um, kind of built my own course. We provide, you know, the core course content. And uh, people generally do use it, but they have a lot of freedom too. I mean, we, we don't really tell them everything they need to do to make that course material effective with the students. They kind of decide that for themselves. <laughs> and then we have a, we have a blended campus program um, called KHEC, which involves students spending some time on campuses, uh, kind of spread around this country mostly, and some time online. And those tend to be kind of uh, more career-oriented things like tra and nursing training programs and uh, dental assisting and legal, legal assisting and, and so on. So we've got kind of a full range. The language programs tend to be primarily classroom-based, almost, almost completely um, offline, but they're increasing the amount of online stuff. So there's a lot of different environments to um, study the effectiveness of learning and teaching in, and that's one of the things that really attracted me. I came from an academic background originally to working with Kaplan is the opportunity to do a lot of research really quickly in a lot of different contexts with many different kinds of students. A, a huge diversity across all of our um, different units. So what are we doing in learning analytics? Well, I want to start <clears throat> by discussing with you a few of the points that ground our thinking in this. And one of them is that our work in learning analytics really should be driven by what we know about learning science and the, cogn the areas of cognitive science that apply to learning and instruction, for example. And, uh, you know, we haven't been able to find, in fact, I've been looking for this for many years, but a lot of really great examples of learning science or cognitive science playing a big role in anything that's happening in post-secondary education. It's also not happening in um, K-12 through education, but um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question why that might be. And in fact, I remember when I was studying educational psychology at UCLA, um, most of the faculty were not using the, the methods that they were um, teaching in the courses. They, that we were you know, studying research on using worked examples and so on, but the faculty themselves teaching the courses were not using those methods in the courses, which is sort of an interesting thing. And I'll just put in a little plug here. I've actually um, organized a, a symposium at AERA this spring in San Francisco that's going to be on this exact topic. Why doesn't research get used in education? So we've got some uh, we're going to look at it from the perspective of educational entrepreneurs, the people who are producing new educational products. And um, you know, we know they're not paying any attention. They don't even know that there is educational research that they could be paying attention to. <laughs> so yeah, so we want to talk to them about why that is and what they could be doing. So we've got, um, representing the educational research side, we've got Ken Katinger from the uh, Pittsburgh Science Learning Center. And then we got a, a guy, Jim Shelton, from the US Department of Education, really to start thinking about how could we change this picture where there's a lot we could be doing to improve teaching and learning, but nobody is paying any attention to it right now. So that's a big thing for us. How do we make that happen in all of the different products and courses that I was talking about? Another key thing for us is that um, if we're thinking about doing more and better kinds of analyses, we need to make sure that we're looking at data that has some validity, that our measures of learning, of non-cognitive factors, and so on, are such that we'd have confidence in the numbers and confidence then in the results to which we're applying our analytics. And you know, put bad data into your analytics and you're not gonna get results that you should have any confidence out of in the end. So that's another big thing for us. And then finally, we as all of you are sure are aware, the, the opportunities that you get from the fact that students are studying more and more content online means we have more opportunities to collect information about what's going on and actually provide better feedback to both students and um, faculty. So we're trying to exploit that, as are many other people in the learning analytics field. Uh, this is a little blurry. I don't know if you can read the line here, but basically it says, uh, well, tonight we're going to let the statistics speak for themselves. And you have a bunch of numbers up there. Well, we are not among the people who believe that if we get a whole bunch of numbers, we have a huge amount of data, and we just kind of look at it, somehow it's going to speak to us and tell us what we should do. Um, what I believe is if you have bad numbers, bad data, then you're not going to get anything useful or interesting out of that. So you really got to make sure, as I was saying before, that the quality of your data are adequate for the kinds of things you want to do with the data. Bad data could, you know, be, in effect, they could sweet talk you, you know, make you feel like you're doing better than you're doing. They could, on the other hand, they could sort of trash talk with you, make, make it look 
like things are much worse off than you thought. Um, or occasionally, they might actually be telling you something that's true, but if you never have any confidence, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know from bad data. When is it actually good results and when not? That's a big, big issue for us. If you did have valid learning measures, there are all sorts of important things you could be doing with that. And many people are now trying to use data to do any and all of these things. Our, our, one of our big things, of course, is improving teaching and learning. And there are a lot of different aspects of that, which I've listed here. <clears throat> including you know, diagnosing, diagnosing where students have difficulty and may need more help and, and uh, so on. But also, you know, we're interested in better learning measures to help us place students more effectively in programs and in courses, and, uh, and even help in their career planning, um, which we, without good learning measures, you, know, you can't really tell what students know already and, and how prepared they are for certain career fields that they might be interested in. So lots of good reasons besides just that we'd like to have good measures in our analytics, we want to make a lot of important decisions with the numbers. And right now, frankly, we don't have the level of confidence that we need in the, in the learning measures that we're working with, so we're trying to improve that. And that's what I'm going to talk about partly here. So, but first of all, let's just talk a little bit about what learning is and what it means to measure it. And I don't know if any of you would degree, uh, d d disagree with what I've mentioned up here, but you know, we, in a broad sense, we think of learning as kind of a change in what you know or what you can do in your knowledge or skills. And that, since it's a change, it happens over time. So if you want to know if it's happened in a certain time period, like in a course, you need to measure it more than one point in time. If you just measure at the end of a course, you can't be sure, in many cases, that students actually learned all the content that the test would say they learned in that course. And this, of course, would be true where you've got a sequence of courses that build one after the other, or if you're giving a, a test to nursing students, let's say at the end of your nursing program, and part of it involves the biology that they need to learn, you can't be sure they learned all of that in your course. They probably didn't, actually. So this means we've got to figure out you know, not only how to measure effectively one time, but how to do it twice. And also, you need to make sure that the two measures are equivalent. It wouldn't give you the right information if you gave a hard test first, and then an easy test your program would look great, or vice versa, you could make your program look bad. They actually have to be statistically equated, um, and or the item scaled somehow by item response. This is not really a technical presentation, but by some method or other, you have to make sure that the information you're getting from two different tests is equivalent. And that's a big problem um, for all of us, I think, figuring out how to do that effectively. I might put a question mark about grades up there as a possibility. We don't, we don't now regard grades as an adequate measure of learning. Um, for a lot of different reasons. People have different criteria that they're using. Everybody grades a little differently. They're using different tasks. So on a, to do a measurement, you basically want students doing the same task or an equivalent task repeatedly um, to measure progress over time. And, and grades, in most cases, don't give you that kind of measurement. So here are our basic learning metrics. Which, were, which we've made quite a bit of progress toward implementing. One is, what percent of course or lesson objectives have students mastered in an individual course? And now to do this, of course, as I pointed out, to measure this, you have to know what your objectives are. You have to define them pretty precisely and then have measures of them and then, be able, and then set some standards for, um, to say that a student has mastered a certain objective, how well would they have to do on the assessments of that objective? get you know, an 80% score if that's how you're scoring it or what, and that would constitute mastery. And then you could say how many objectives have students achieved that level of mastery at. Um, and then overall, we'd like to look at the percent of students who have achieved mastery of all of the course or, or program objectives. So for example, in a whole nursing course, let's say, how many students have mastered how many of the objectives after they finished the course? And then uh, this is a chart which you may not be able to see from the back rows, but basically this is a job aid for the people building our courses who are developing assessments within the courses. And what we're using is categories from cognitive science, really started with the expert novice research. What are the kinds of knowledge that experts um, bring to bear when they're solving problems or, or doing their work? And so you have categories like procedural knowledge, factual knowledge, and conceptual knowledge, and so on. And what we've done is try to lay out what are the ways you could measure these kinds of knowledge as sort of a guide for people working with it in different courses. So if you're just trying to measure whether students know a bunch of facts, that takes one kind of approach. But if you want to know in some of the more complicated 
categories like can they integrate and use the knowledge that they have, what kinds of tasks are appropriate for that. So this is kind of a help to, for people to design the assessments that we then want to do some validation work to make sure that we can have some confidence in it. And that's, that's what I'll talk about next. So we have this system of things that we call course level assessments and general education literacies that have been implemented actually in all 1,000 of our courses in, the, in Kaplan University, the online university. And um, we've been looking at the reliability of scoring of those tasks. But first, here's a little description. In each course, I've referred briefly to this before, there are about four to six course level assessments based on major course learning objectives. And you can see one example from one course of what a CLA objective might be like. Describe typical neuro neurological and behavioral responses to stress and their implications and so on. Um, so to do that, that, the task for that is typically a complex project, um, usually situated in some more or less real context where students have to do this in order to solve something, some problem in a real life context. And then there are these things called the general education literacies, which are things like you know, basic writing abilities and um, basic analytic abilities and things like this. This is a little bit more experimental to me, whether the, this will actually play out. But, um, all of the programs have actually, uh, have actually set up some of these in their courses too because they believe over the course of any of our programs, students should get better in their ability to analyze and write about the content or do other kinds of general things with the communicate about the content and so on. And the kinds of, project, the kinds of examples of tasks are, are pretty broad. Um, some people have used basically multiple choice tests for some of the objectives, but typically they tend to be more open-ended kinds of things that faculty have to judge or score. And that's where the reliability issue comes in that we're interested in. Um, it could be discussion boards, too. Some people have actually set up um, you know, discussion boards on a particular topic, set up guidelines for how students should participate and what kinds of things they should say, and then evaluated students' responses to say, yes, you know, somebody, John, actually understands this content well enough for me to say he has mastered that objective. And then guidance was provided to all of the course teams and in developing the, both the tasks and the rubrics for these, for these um, things. So we did a little study. Uh, actually, we've done several studies. But the first one I'll talk about um, involved just a, an analysis of large-scale data over several years, data from um, most of the students um, taking most of our courses for several years, and um, looked at how their, what happened to their CLA and GEL scores um, over the year, and we would expect, our expectation was, I'll talk about the second bullet first, that your writing scores, if we're actually measuring your writing ability effectively, that shouldn't go up and down in different courses or over time. It should either stay the same, um, and this is, this is what I say, I mean, people's writing ability doesn't get, we, one interesting thing we know though is that does fluctuate quite a bit of, uh, across different kinds of tasks. So the task you're doing can show that you're a better or worse writer, depending on the task. And you are a better writer in areas that you know a lot about, obviously. So there are some interesting things that we have to look at here. But in general, our feeling was, if your writing scores are going you know, really up one year and then really down the next year, something is not right about the measurement. And we have to fix that. That's part of what we were looking at. So our model, we ran basically regression models in this. Um, really suggested, another thing we were looking at, we did see, we did see um, variation that we did not want to see. Fluctuations in student scores, student scores going down way too much, going up way too much on average over thousands of students over the years in, in both the CLAs and the GELs. And the major reason for that was variability in faculty scoring. So faculty within the same course were not, were not scoring the same students um, similarly, the same kinds of students similarly, I should say, because what you're trying to do is parcel out other information about students and seeing if similar kinds of students who have had similar patterns of past performance, whoops, I got myself out of there. Um, we're not being, uh, students who had similar patterns of, of 
performance previously and looked like they were equivalent kinds of students, we're not getting the same, scored the same way. So basically we're looking at big data sets, um, partialing out lots of different kind of factors and trying to see what is accounting the most for the variation in student scoring. And you would expect, what, if things were working right, what should account for the most variation is student performance. All the variations in scores should be due, should be due to how students are doing not to variations in the faculty scoring. So this is one kind of evidence that um, the consistency of faculty scoring was not enough for us to do some of the serious things that we're interested in doing with these scores that I showed on a previous slide. And we've done some other studies. Oh, one other result I should mention is we, we found the same thing both for the gel scores, for the writing scores, and the, the CLAs. And some other differences like, um, let's see if we should, I guess it was on the previous slide, let me go back. Um, there's a little more consistency among the full-time faculty and faculty have been around longer than the newer and part-time faculty, which I guess is not too surprising. And some other studies we've done suggest that when we have faculty teaching a course score other people's papers, they score them lower than the original faculty did and on average about a point, this is on a five-point scoring scheme roughly corresponding to, to grades, where one is kind of no, no knowledge or a failing level of knowledge. Um, and this has been replicated across several different studies, which is kind of an interesting thing to us, that um, if you know who the students are, there's kind of a tendency to, I guess, give them credit for other things you know about them. So we're not really sure why this is. Um, but we are, we are now undertaking some studies to see, is it possible to get people to score more consistently with each other? by maybe providing examples of student work at different score points or doing training, any of the things one would commonly do to improve the, the reliability of performance scoring. And um, you might be familiar with, uh, I'm just gonna mention, um, I don't know if anyone has heard about Western Governors University, but they, it's another um, university that offers primarily online courses, or I guess exclusively online courses. They've decided to hire faculty who just score student work. So they score all the work for a course, and the people teaching the courses take a look at those scores and they can add comments or whatever, but it, it does give you kind of consistent scoring of all the student work if you have kind of a, a third party score everything. You were gonna say, well, my sorry? question was about faculty scoring their own students higher. <clears throat> it seemed like from what you said second that, that they knew when they were grading someone who wasn't their own student. Is that correct? Yes, the way that study was set up is we took papers from, score, from previous courses and had them rescored by faculty. So they, yes, they knew those were not their own. So yeah. when, you first, when I first saw the slide, my intuition was that you scored answers higher that uh, characterized the way that you taught or used words or concepts or language in the way that you taught it in the, course or in the classroom. So it looked more familiar to you or it looked right to you. But if it wasn't really blind, so it, it, I mean, the way to test that would be to blindly score a set of papers, some of which are your own, and some of which are somebody else's students, and see whether the difference. Works. That would that would be an interesting study. And you're thinking, and and we would want to make sure that the teachers knew which students were their own. No, that they don't. That they don't know. Okay. Yeah. To see if it's just a function a function of, yeah, that's a different hypothesis. But I, I think one definitely worth testing. And, and we don't actually know what accounts for this difference right now. But, so this would be very interesting for us to find out. But then, then our goal is, because we would like to do things, and I'm going to talk about this later. We have big online courses where we could test, we could randomly assign students to different conditions and then test the effects on learning, test the effects of those strategies on learning and other outcomes. But if our learning measures are not being scored consistently, then we have a problem. So it's really important for us to do things like this. And of course it would be, I think useful and interesting if, or helpful to students if they could get consistent feedback on writing and other kinds of performance in their courses. And we may, we may experiment a little bit. There are, there are as you know, automatic um, program, there are programs that can auto, you know, where they'll automatically score essays and other kinds of things. Um, we may test some of those too. None of those programs really give good um, individual feedback based on the particular response right now. So, and that's really an important part of feedback, so we'd have to figure out how to do that. But it might give us at least a reliable score that we could use for research purposes. Yes, sorry. In regards to the last question, uh, 
I don't know that the two have to be mutually exclusive. That is, if students that you know are maybe coming to your office, maybe they are tending to um, think or explain things in like manner in which you teach them. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, th this is an interesting hypothesis that now I want to go back and test because I haven't, I hadn't thought of this before you guys have been bringing this up. But yes, autom and also automated scoring is not, doesn't have to be exclusive with faculty also um, scoring, but um, and I don't, we don't know how this would work practically, but it's something we'll probably take a look at. Okay, some other metrics we're um, also experimenting with are if you could use some scaling method to scale all of the items in a course or a program together, which could include your performance task rated by students, uh, you could use item response theory scaling or something like that, you could look at changes in student scale scores over time. Um, and I think we'll be experimenting with this too. Uh, many people have thought of this, but nobody has actually implemented it. And it's probably maybe a little too technical to get into at the moment, but maybe worth if anybody's interested in exploring this later on. And we are also really interested in a sort of a, a fundamental metric. If students appear to do well on a topic in one course, in a course sequence, course A in a course sequence, they should do better on the subsequent, the next topics in the sequence in a subsequent course. So if they're, you know, you have a course that's teaching prerequisites, let's say math one, something or other, and then math two, students should do better in, if you've measured correctly in the first task, then you should see that students who have done better or have successfully passed the content of, of one course should do, do better in the second course. So that's another thing we, we actually began to, ex, to um, explore. And we're also interested in just engagement, how are students you know, taking seriously, doing the work, and are they being retained, and how satisfied are they? And in the end, since many of our students are enrolling in our programs because they have very specific job or career goals, um, as we were talking about earlier today, we're interested in capturing people get to do what they do, people get the jobs that they were hoping to get when they started the program. Or well, why not? So we've mapped out, I'm not going to talk much about this, but just to show you, we've mapped out for ourselves what some of the major important indicators that I just talked about, learning, retention, engagement, satisfaction, career success, and what are the things that influence those? Now there are other things that could go on the chart that I didn't include here just for this purpose, is like support services within a campus can have a big effect on retention and so on. But our goal is to map out everything we want to measure eventually and begin to test the strength of these relationships to find out things like, if you could measure all this thing effect these things effectively, you could, you could make decisions like, would it make more difference to improve student motivation, would it make more difference to their learning to spend time and money and resources on that or on fixing your curriculum, for example, and fixing your instructional design. That's our ultimate goal, to be able to do with our data, you know, testing the relationships, uh, you know, basically using structure equational and modeling, but probably some techniques some of you are familiar with. Okay, so here's another example. I was talking about the studies we've done to test the reliability of our CLA scoring. And um, in this example, we were actually looking at huge data sets we have in our test preparation courses, tens of thousands of, item, of practice items available to students. And students will typically take at least five or six practice tests as they're studying for the LSAT or something like that, or the MCAT. <clears throat> They'll take five or six practice tests. Um, and it, we're actually trying to better equate those practice tests. But that gives us a, a huge database of you know, the last 10 years or so of, t of students taking thousands of items. And we decided to take a look at whether the sequence of performance on these items would tell us something about the sequencing of curriculum topics, whether we might actually made some improvements. So we wanted to compare pathways that would be indicated by assessment. So that means <clears throat> if one item is easier than another one in the same conceptual sequence and you know, curriculum sequence, then um, that indicates that maybe you would teach the the, you know, the item that seems easier before you would teach the one that seems more difficult. So assessment data can give you some ideas about how you might sequence topics. Easier ones first, more difficult ones later. Doesn't tell you everything about that. So we had our subject matter experts actually map out curriculum sequences, which tend to be pretty linear, because that's how you would often teach a course in a pretty linear fashion. We'll give you a little example. And then we, then we test, we said, does our assessment data 
this huge database of assessment item responses we have confirm those sequences. That's basically what the study was about. I'll show you some maps of this in a second. A couple of things that came out of this, in addition to the sequences themselves, um, where we, we actually ended up getting better alignment of our um, items to the subject matter content. So for each item, we tried to say, well, which, of, which topic and skills is that item actually assessing? That's the item alignment challenge. And that actually got improved as a result of these data analyses that we did. So just to give you a little idea how things might work. So here's a typical learning sequence, one topic after another. And let's say you've created a test where you're testing each one of the sub Now the test might not administer the items in exactly this order, but eventually you could see that a student might, might have mastered, you got item A right, which is, which is related to topic A, then B, then C, and D they had trouble with. And then after that they had trouble with. So you'd want to start instruction right on that topic then kind of the first topic in the sequence the student was having difficulty, if you're designing an adaptive course for students, let's say. Alternatively, you might have a mapping that suggests, well, you know, a, B and C, from A, you could go to either B or C. And if you look at a lot of curriculum, that, that happens all the time. You could say, I mean, everything doesn't have to go linearly. It would be possible. You, there's a lot of places where you could branch to different topics and somebody has to make a decision. We were trying to let the data help us make that decision. So here's a case where, okay, you've got an item A that a student gets right, an item B, these are different topics, then you test C, then you test E, and the student doesn't get item G, which is part of the second path or second pathway, and then you get this different sort of pattern. So you could start in either one of these places then. Next. And what we want to figure out is, do some starting points work better for different kinds of students? There's some profiles of students where you know we do better off starting in C or D. That's part of our goal with the big data analysis. So we have, as I said, thousands of science items, about 150 different kind of unique test forms, all of which look pretty good, and about 50 million data points altogether. Kind of a big data thing, and um, about 8,400 little tags. These these are descriptors of skills or topics that were aligned to the items. Um, and it turned out, actually we found this out later in another study, you don't have to have that fine grain of labeling. If you have for a core, a typical course, something like a couple hundred labels um, actually gives you as, as much information as you would get from having 8,000 labels for the content. You can overdo it in terms of the granularity of your labeling of items. And here's just an example of some of the kinds of skills that might be aligned to the subtopic electric field lines. So, you know, recognizing what lines of force are and so on. All of these things got aligned to that subtopic, and items related to these all would filter up to that subtopic. Then we went through a bunch of phases, which I'll show you kind of graphically. Uh, this is just a map of different kind of pathways, possible curriculum sequences. There are four different areas of science here. Uh, let's see, physics, chemistry, I think geology, and I can't off the top of my head remember what another one. So as we went through several iterations, the person doing this work eventually started collect, uh, connecting the difficulty of items across the different sciences. Because remember, we're having students just study all this content kind of all at once. So it could be that you could jump back and forth between sciences and get quite a bit out of that. Then we started adding p-values to the graph, to the graphs. She added um, color coding to show in the, in, the, in the red lines here, these are bad links, meaning it looks like there should be a sequence there, but actually the easier items are coming after the more difficult ones. So that to us, at least as far as the assessment data are suggesting, is not a good sequence. So that, that got adjusted, the sequence has got adjusted so there's more greens in the data. And then, you know, we went through several other kinds of phases, regrouping the subjects back together, doing a little reorganizing of the content, um, recreating the sequences and grouping items together under different topic headings, actually improved the pathways here, as it turned out. And then finally, a few tweaks, and we were kind of done. So one of, the, one of the findings was these visualizations actually helped a lot to figure out where the bad links are and what we, what we needed to do. And then there were consultations with subject matter experts to say, okay, this link doesn't look right. If we changed it, would it still be okay with you? And invariably they would say, yeah, I didn't really think of it that way, but actually what, what I usually teach first is not 
strictly speaking, a prerequisite for what I usually teach second. <clears throat> um, and so we found out on the right side is kind of initial starting more linear path, um, which does have some branching within it and some different starting point. That really flattened out. And what we found out is you could actually start in a lot of different places and uh, teach the subject, you know, you could start in one of the, I don't know, there are like six or seven different starting points up there and end up with equally good or even better results for different students. So again, our goal would be, are there different starting points better for different individual students? And we could manage that in online courses. Very difficult to do in, an, you know, in a classroom. So you can't, at this point, these maps, when we print them out, were huge. But uh, the important thing, I think, is just the shape of the graph itself. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is kind of a one that you probably are more familiar with yourselves. We've been trying to do this, is another example. Uh, in this case, we're trying to use big data that we routinely collect to predict um, which students are likely to fail or drop out of our program. And it's part of something I'm going to lead into, how we're trying to set up research pipelines to figure out what would help these students. So this particular study, same university, 1,000 online courses, extensive database of background information on students. <clears throat> and we analyzed, um, let's see, about 15,000 students over a two-year period using really a, a kind of analysis that comes from medical testing where, yeah, in this case, we're not trying to predict whether students would die, but whether they would drop out or not succeed in the course. <clears throat> so um, I think you've probably been doing some kinds of analysis like that, but our results, because we have a somewhat different population, we tend to have older students than traditional universities, and most of them are working, probably a majority of them are working full time. Um, so here's some of our findings that um, the, the age comparisons are with students who are 28 or younger. So actually being in an older category there between 29 and 38 reduces your risk of dropping out for whatever reason. I mean, we, still, we have to find out more about what's causing these things. Between, as you get older, between 38 and 45, that, the yellow indicates us that a significant finding. That's a little bit of an increase in 7.5, but it's not, it's not significant, so virtually there's no difference there. The older than 45, though, increases your risk. Um, having transfer credits significantly increases your risk. And our guess at this um, is that students who have failed before in other courses and are trying again in Kaplan um, are not probably any more likely to succeed, or are not very much more likely to succeed with us, unless we do something different from what we're doing now. And then of course, uh, you can see enrolling, being enrolled in higher level courses has a, has a, you know, reduces the chances that you're gonna drop out. And here's some other kind of interesting things. We have quite a few students who are actually in the military, in the active military. <clears throat> that reduces your risk, because you know, the, the transfer thing and the previous college thing are uh, related. The female thing is, a, is one we've really got to do something about. I mean, you know, we just, I mean, we have guesses. We can, we can look at the demographics involved and see that um, you know, it's a lot of single mothers, for example, trying to, who are working, trying to go back to school and improve their setting. And, very difficult kind of situation. But having dependence, per se, actually reduces your risk. So, so those are our findings. It would be interesting at some point to compare you know, what you guys are seeing in your kind of analysis. And here's another example of the use of data. This is a little bit more, a little smaller scale kind of thing. I'm going to show you how we're using, how we use information about students' motivation to adapt and provide some responses by doing things in these four categories. Um, one of the problems students have with motivation is they just don't think a particular task is worth doing. You know, what's the purpose of this? Or, you know, it looks too hard or whatever. Uh, so if, if that happens, then students don't even start the task. And this is a key thing. A key point of motivation is just to get started, you know, and if you can't get yourself started, what can we do to make that happen? <clears throat> Another thing is your confidence or self-efficacy level. Self-efficacy has to do with your feelings about whether you can succeed at something or not. And um, it turns out, interestingly, that having too high a confidence level actually can be de demotivating. An example would be in our test prep courses where um, students are actually not very good at evaluating their own skills and deficiencies. So if you think you're really good at something, you're not gonna spend as much time studying at that. 
as you probably should if you're actually not good at that, if you, if you misvalue that. So it's interesting, you usually think about how we increase students' confidence, but you also in some cases need to decrease students' confidence on certain areas of knowledge where they don't actually have high skills now. And uh, how can we help to provide more positive mood and reform students' beliefs about controllability? When students believe that they have no control over their success, they're demotivated to try, they're, they're, they're not going to try as hard as if they believe they could actually have some control over it. So we collect data through little surveys that are inserted into the courses. And the questions are just things like, how interested are you in the topic of this course? How confident are, that you, are you that you can succeed? And so on. These are online surveys, as you can probably tell. <clears throat> and then, two kinds of things happen. One is feedback is given to the faculty, the online faculty, based on patterns here that take a look at students' performance. First of all, how are they actually doing in the course? So if you can see up at the top, a student here has high performance in the class. Their self-efficacy is high. Their attribution, they think things are controllable. No extra help needed. They can just go on to the test or whatever comes next. But other kinds of things. Here's a student whose performance is low. Self-efficacy is high, so they're sort of overconfident here. So what we want to get them to do is somehow, we want them to put more time in on this by suggesting, well, your, your test scores show you're not really as good at this as you might think, so spend more time, and so on. So it's sort of a differentiated response depending on a pattern of information that we have on different kinds of variables for students. So there is guidance for faculty on what messages exactly to give to students to help them do this, either by emails or phone calls or, or so on. And then, there are also online supports. So this is a little message, I'm not sure if you can read it, but basically this is a message that's popped up for students that says, you know, you needed quite a bit of assistance on that last practice test. Um, so that, that's an indicator that's actually pretty difficult for you, and you might have used a strategy that didn't really work for you in the past. So, um, but with additional practice, you know, other people who have had difficulty with this have been able to succeed, you know, get it right in the end just by spending more time after they initially failed, that kind of thing. And then there's a little video here, which can't play from the slide, but basically a, a CEO of a company called Random Kid talking about her struggles with things like this and how she eventually, by just working more on it, overcame them. So we have that sort of two-pronged thing, the faculty support plus online messaging to students based on the information we're collecting online in response to those surveys. Okay, so we are trying to take advantage. I was talking about our hopes that we can exploit affordances from technology. We've got the, some of the longitudinal analysis, which I've been showing you. There's also the, the possibility of collecting microdata, which some people use to refer to, you know, collecting information. I, Clickstream data, for example. Every move that a student makes online, you can track and then try to figure. We haven't gotten so much into that yet. But also experimental investigations online. Randomized control studies, um, which is one of the next things that I'll talk about. And then uh, we just looked at one example, not of adaptive instruction, but adaption to students' different levels of motivation. And of course, when you get into collecting a lot more data, you may just find out that you've got a lot more problems than you thought you had before, as you can see kind of from this graph. So the person saying, after we got the computer, we're better able to track our problems. As an explanation for why are our problems going up so much, um, it can be that now you've got more information, so it's looking like you've got a lot more problems than you used to have before. Kind of a, a cutting edge here. But here's, here's a couple of examples of monitoring trends and patterns. Um, these are, these are measures here on the left graph here of different kinds of um, outcomes. Uh, we've got GPA, we've got the CLA scores that I've explained to you before, and then here's something called the U-rate, which sort of a, um, requires you to be doing well in the, in the course and um, not dropping out in order to get a high U-rate. So one interesting thing here is we lined all these three indicators up in time on top of each other. So this is one point in time here. And you can see, it looks like something went on here, like this. GPA went up, the U-rate went down, which is good. This is a measure of students failing, basically. It's the unsuccess rate. And then the CLAs were kind of an upward trend, so who knows what to make out of that. Um, but another interesting thing, I mean, here's some, there's fluctuation here anyway. 
So if you pick any one point in time here, you know, if you say, well, something happened right here because it went up, well, actually, then it went down a little bit later on. So it's pretty difficult to just look at one indicator like that and say, you know, pick one point in time and say, oh, well, now we've got a trend here. Um, it's been more interesting for us to see what's happening across multiple indicators, and maybe there's something there. Now, it turns out um, there was a change in the basic student interface at this point in time, which had, a, you know, their conclusion was it had these effects here. That, to me, is not a conclusion I would necessarily make from these data, but it's kind of suggestive, worth looking into that possibility. And then over here, you've got some more examples where different kinds of changes in uh, course curriculum and other kinds of things happen, and you can kind of, again, see, you know, smaller fluctuations. But in the bigger pattern of almost kind of random fluctuation, it's, it gets, for me, harder to say that you can look at one point in time and pick out, you know, say, look, there's something went up. Well, things are going up and down all the time, so let's be careful about making that interpretation. <clears throat> And then the big thing for us is these kinds of studies don't really tell us what to do. When we can indicate that something's going wrong for particular students because of our data, what do we do? Um, so a couple of things. One, we're starting to do some more some interviewing, more qualitative kinds of stuff to get a better understanding. And the other big drive is to do some experimental tests of strategies for helping students and teachers, actually, by building what we're calling research pipelines. And as I was explaining to some people this morning, we're using this kind of, a, the metaphor for us is like a roller coaster in which the cars are always running, empty or full. And we have some pretty large classes, online classes, that have 50 to 100 sections at a time for one 10-week period, 20 to 30 students in, section, in each section, and we could randomly assign students to those sections and randomly assign different kinds of treatments to those sections then. So we've got, in effect, randomized control studies going on. We want to be able to do, build the capability to just do this routinely in our large classes, have it set up so that the random assignment happens automatically at the time of enrollment, and then we and other people can run, you know, every 10 weeks a new set of studies. If you had this many different sections, you could, you could test, you know, five, six different kinds of treatments if you wanted to. And in some cases, we can randomly assign. There are some kinds of treatments that don't require uh, teacher effort or teacher involvement. Um, we're doing a little motivational priming thing where little messages pop up randomly to different students. And the teachers know about it, but they don't really have to do anything. In cases where the faculty do have to do something, then we probably have to randomly assign the sections because it's too hard for them to be doing eight different things with different students. Yes? You touched on this a little bit already, but um, it seems that with the nature of the treatment that you might, there might be some ethical concerns in terms of the type of instruction given to the students. So I just kind of, what is it like, when you say treatment, is it, is it the thing that it might actually help students more and you might even find that I feel like there's a sort of an ethical concern there? Um, being that, why don't all students get it? Is that the concern? If, if that's the issue, yeah. right? If yeah. the assumption is that the treatment will help students, but yeah. you're randomly assigning it, then you're not helping some other students, right? So it really just, that's why, it, Yes, I agree with that, yeah. I mean, it, it does depend on the nature of treatment. We have our own IRB, and we're actually also collaborating with a bunch of university researchers who have to pass the same studies through their IRBs. Um, but typically, we don't know for sure that what we're trying is going to work. If we did, we would just do it. Um, we're often looking at the research literature and taking ideas that have been tested in, like, Rich Mayer at UCSB, for example, has done a lot of great multimedia studies showing, you know, for example, that if, you're, if you've got text on a screen that you want people to read, you shouldn't have a voice reading that text to them because students will read at different speeds and that will actually interfere with their reading to have a voice saying it. So that's been tested in his classes at UCSB with typically about 60 students. We don't know if that would work broadly across all of our courses, so we may want to test something like that and try it with some students and not with others, and then we do that for one term, and if it works, then everybody would benefit from getting that in the, in the future terms. But yeah, I mean, we, we always have to worry about basic ethics. I mean, we wouldn't do things that we think would impair anybody's performance, for example, at least so far that we know about. Yeah, yeah. So here are some, uh, some of the people we're involved with who are actually starting to use the pipeline. I mean, we're kind of building the pipeline and running studies in it at the same time. Um, 
you may recognize some of these people if you do uh, cognitive science or learning science research. Uh, the work examples thing that we're doing with John Swoller is actually really interesting. Well, in fact, oh wait, I've got some results on that. Um, motivational priming is actually a really powerful technique where you can put little messages before a lesson that you know is going to be hard based on previous experience. And it's kind of like the message we were showing before, where a student who ideally you would adapt this to the particular student. So you would have each student get a little message before a difficult lesson that says, um, I, you know, I really struggled with this. This, is, this, is, this was really hard for me, but here's what I did to succeed at it. Just putting in a little thing like that, it won't improve everybody's performance, but it will significantly improve the overall performance of groups of students, at least in the previous study. So we're starting to test things like that on a really large scale. And one of the things we're interested in is finding out what are the things that are relatively cheap and easy to do that could make the most difference. Um, some things, like redesigning a whole course using every known multimedia principle, we have, we have done studies like that, actually. Um, but it's been much more interesting to us more recently to, to experiment with smaller scale things um, and then looking at the cumulative effect of doing a lot of those things over time. So we do one little thing, we see what that effect is, then we add something else and so on, kind of an incremental approach to relatively small scale types of strategies. And uh, we're also starting to have conversations with Khan Academy, edX, and Coursera. Um, they're interested in us kind of helping with their learning analytics, but we may start using their research pipelines too. Some of them have even more students than we do studying online, and um, they're kind of offering the possibility for us to study the effectiveness of some of the things that they're doing. But we are, we've been very open. Um, I've got a couple of seminars or symposia, as I said, um, that we're doing at, at AERA this year where we're kind of co-presenting things with various researchers. So we're all about, let's publish as much as we can, let's become you know, part of the general research community and so on. Uh, and one interesting question that we're going to start taking on is if we do experimental studies and we get significant results, and then we look at the kind of longitudinal data that I was showing you before, the little graphs, do we see little perturbations at the point where we do these experiments? And could we eventually say, gee, you know, we get some results that are showing up in our longitudinal analysis that are this, when we stick in little alternative treatments. Um, just as part of our ongoing routine, we try some different strategies. We look at our, you know, routine longitudinal data and we see, wow, there, was, there looked like there was an effect here. And oh, by the way, we put in a little treatment right there. Um, would the results, in other words, from the longitudinal routine data look the same as what we get from our little experimental studies with the analysis we do specifically targeting that study? We don't know yet, but an interesting kind of thing. And um, really one last thing here that I want to mention. Have you, has anyone heard of Mechanical Turk? Oh, plenty of people have, okay. Uh, I don't know, is, is anyone doing studies? I'm, we, we started to use that as a research site, yeah. Um, and in fact, I'll just show you an example. There's an article in Science, uh, mag uh, on the online version of Science Magazine about this. But uh, Mechanical Turk is basically a part of, it's part of Amazon. You can go to Amazon and find Mechanical Turk. Um, and if you're interested, I can even give you some of our, we've had little trainings within Kaplan on how to use it effectively to do studies. We usually use it in, in combination with things like Qualtrics. Which is, a, which is a little tool that allows you to design surveys and, and put in assessment items and things like that. But you can recruit people online. It's a terrible name, Mechanical Turk. Um, but it comes from, uh, some of you probably know, there was a, I can't remember, was it the 18th century or something? Somebody built a little, what was supposedly a little robot chess player that could beat most you know, human chess players. And it turned out there was actually a very small person inside there operating the machine, but it was called Mechanical Turk, the, the little robot thing. So Amazon adopted that name for this little scheme. It's basically, you can hire people from all around the world. You put on task and you say, you know, I'll, f I'll give you $2 to find, you know, to list um, the addresses of all the State Department, uh, all the um, State Departments of Education in all the states in the United States, for example. And somebody will do that for $2. Or you can ask people to do it for their state for five cents or something like that. You can create these tests. You can create qualifying tests. You can say, you know, if you take this little five item test and if you get a certain score, then I'll hire you for five dollars to do some kind of work for me. So we started trying to use it to do some of the different things that we've listed up here. 
um, to test test items, for example, that we want to see how different types of students perform on it. Um, we're using it for usability testing, and um, here's the little article I was mentioning from Science Mag Online. Here's a study we did actually in about four hours. It's the work example study that I was uh, mentioning before. And this study was done on the day of the deadline to submit proposals to AERA. <laughs> <laughs> and we had some previous data from a previous Mechanical Turk study that wasn't that impressive. So I said, well, let's, let's try something a little bit different. On this, in this study, we're working with John Sweller to design work examples to teach um, law students who are, um, well, students who are trying to get in law school to take the LSAT to solve logical reasoning problems. And these are very weird kinds of problems that most students don't get much training on, and they're, they're very difficult for our students. Typically, students can only answer, you know, 50% or less of these kinds of problems on any of the practice tests that we give them. And their performance on other kinds of items is much higher. So we were te trying to teach these by three-hour video demonstrations to students. So, um, you know, a professor would give a three-hour thing on how to solve this kind of problem, and here's all the different kind of categories of problems like this and so on. And John Sweller, looked, he's at the University of New South Wales, um, Australia, I guess. And um, he looked at the videos and said, well, I think there's much too much extraneous stuff in, in here. I think the real essence of this could be boiled down to giving students examples of problems annotated by an, ex by an expert who's reading the problem. And so little er he drew about five little arrows and made little comments to each of the things. And it takes maybe about a couple of minutes to look at one of those worked examples um, and be tested. Would, would those be as effective, giving some of those, as looking at a long video? Uh, so here's the results of our first Mechanical Turk study. You can see the average post-test scores um, and the standard deviations and so on. But so studying eight worked examples was more effective than looking at the long video thing. In this case, the video wasn't three. These students spent only about 100 minutes. Um, so we have, and the students studying the eight worked examples spent eight minutes. So uh, there's all sorts, there's huge benefits for us in finding this. One, developing three-hour videos takes a lot more time than developing eight worked examples. And this is, people have got so excited about this, and we've now replicated. This is actually kind of transforming some of our courses from, you know, the old way of, you know, somebody's up there writing on the board showing you how to do problems and talking about the background and all that. Um, and it turned out also there is not a significant difference here between, uh, these numbers are not significantly different. So doing, uh, actually, performance seems to have gone down here, but no significant difference. There's a, there's a certain point at which doing a lot of extra work examples doesn't get you any kind of benefit. And basically, we want to find out what that number is for every kind of problem in, in every kind of course. We have now started to replicate this in the real course with our students. And so far, we've got only 33 students compared with 30, but that number is going to keep going up over the next couple of weeks. These are students working online, so they kind of do it at their own pace, and it takes us a while to get the data. But we got, let's see. I talked about this study in the morning of that deadline day, as I said. We, we had the data collected within two hours, I think. We had like several hundred students here do these practice items, students from around the world. And very interestingly, the performance is very similar to their overall performance to our own students in these courses. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, it, this is opening some very interesting opportunities. In addition to our own pipeline, we will probably start trying some things with Mechanical Turk where it's kind of expensive, more difficult to implement it with our own students. So we may do some preliminary pilot tests using Mechanical Turk. And then there's a wide range of other kinds of things that we're looking at, the possibilities of employing better, better analytics. We don't have a lot of simulations right now that enable us to collect, you know, kind of ongoing clickstream data, but we're building some. And uh, looking as everybody is about how do we how can we use social media and so on and collect better information, maybe about some of the non-cognitive factors that might help us understand what students are doing better and help them improve and so on. So that is kind of a quick survey of some of the things that we're doing, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think about them.
is that if people have questions that they would like to ask, we're going to break now and um, go downstairs, and there'll be a, a question session down there. Well, so should we take a few questions here now? Questions here. Okay, let's take a few questions here now. Does anyone have them? <laughs> In your study with the Turkers, do you um, have those kind of pre-qualifying things, you know, the, they have to pass the proficiency in English or whatever? Because I know from my own colleagues who work with Mechanical Turk, I would be surprised if the population of Turkers that you get to do this is that close to, to the population of students. We, we did not, and I think we might have just got kind of lucky. We did describe generally what they were going to have to do, and the, so that may have screened out some people. Um, I think we probably the study would probably be better if we did add in some kind of pre-qualifying thing like that. But as I said, the results were not very different. Uh, when you look at the overall performance on the items from what we typically see from our, from our um, students. So. But they're also 50% kind of score. Yeah. So nobody does these tests very well. Yes, right. exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and and interesting data. I don't think the data is necessarily well hung on No, no, and, and as I said, we would not take any major action on these data. This this is kind of we want to test something to see if it looks like we've got something going, which it did in this case, and now we're trying it with our own students, which for us will be the real proof. I think where I'm coming from is there you know, there was a day when we gathered all our data in psychology from uh, psychology undergrads, right? And I, and I worry with data science that we're quickly going to replace psychology undergrads with mechanical surgery. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the good arguments in one of the things that you're talking about in here is doing it in the real environment. And if you care about improving performance you yeah. in your class, you should do it for the students in your class. But, but we are also, when we do things in the real environment, which is more complicated, we want to do things that, there have, that there's some evidence for. Now, we, within Kaplan, I mean, we have faculty and everybody in the world suggesting fab things we could try. Um, you know, learning styles comes up a lot and other kinds of things. But if we can't actually find any real evidence to support the possibility that it might work, we don't want to support that. So, but Turk gives us, you know, one, one way to kind of jump from the lab studies to a new domain. Now, one reason John Sweller has really been excited to work with us on this is he's worked in algebra and fairly simple, you know, solving linear equations kind of problems, never in such a complex domain as this. So he was really interested to see that his approach could actually work on a much more difficult kind of problem. Yes, ma'am. So your overall framework you have for faculty using the content knowledge and the categorical knowledge of Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't have measures that I think are strong enough right now. But we do have some. I mean, and, and people look at things like um, what, what have the faculty taught before? What courses did they take before they became faculty? And all those, those are very indirect indicators of your, of your content knowledge. So we, um, I mean, we do have contracts and many of our faculty belong to unions and so on so we can't just do anything but um, we probably will be interested the kind of measure I probably would try to implement because I've done this with K through 12 teachers is not just direct questions of your knowledge but having having faculty evaluate student work and um, which is much more palatable too so here's a student said this about something and can you evaluate? And so if the student said a lot of wrong things and a faculty can't recognize that, that's one indicator of content knowledge. So when we start to do that, that's probably the kind of measure that uh, we'll be using. Yes, sir. Does, does Kaplan tend to approach these uh, analytic problems systematically, or are they done more on an ad hoc basis? Uh, we're moving from the ad hoc to more systematic. I, you know, I wouldn't say we, I would call our approach right now overall systematic. We have this core group of which I'm a part whose job is to make that more systematic and to provide kind of a vision for what's going on. So I was more or less directly involved in all of these studies. So for me, they're kind of part of a, a bigger picture, and I want to make sure in other units we start to get in some other areas that are not covered by these examples. So the goal is I think like it is for everybody to get more systematic in our planning. I mean, otherwise it's just wasteful. If you have thousands of people around the world just doing whatever, they're going to they're going to replicate a lot of the work. They're not going to share findings and so on. In fact, I, we want to broaden this so we're sharing our findings with you know you and vice versa. 
um, which I, I think helps us all get more systematic about what we're doing rather than all, we're, we're, we're either all struggling or some of us are making progress but nobody else knows about it and so on. So let's take one more question and then we're going to move downstairs to 1067. And David and I are going to be lunch, so if you'd like to grab an extra drink, we won't be over there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's amazing the scale that you're able to answer questions quickly. I was curious about the, the end goal of the outcome of the students being able to get the positions they're searching and stuff like that. Um, how are you approaching getting information and data on that? Whereas if the students some of the course, yeah. how do they give you, do they run away? Do they <laughs> back on? You know? Well, th this is another whole set of studies in itself, sort of, you know. What can we do to get better information from students about what happens to them later on? So. People have been trying, like incentives, you know, I'll give you $25 if you tell me whether you have a job or not, um, <laughs> and, and what that job is. Um, I mean, so there's that, where I mean, we're working on, but the other thing is, um, and, and for many reasons we're doing this, just kind of setting up better relationships with the, the largest employers of our students. So, I mean, that helps us with actually getting our students placed, and then it also helps us know that they did get placed. So. Uh, that, I think, in the end, is probably going to be the most promising. We, we haven't really had a lot of success pushing up our response rates to just, you know, uh, for one thing, people, you lose track of people, so you, you can't send them things, you don't know where they are anymore, and then when you do send them something, the return rates are typically not all that high. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's an issue. All right, with that, let's thank you again.